How's everyone doing? Yeah, it's that time of the year, isn't it? Can you hear me? Yeah, I was just emailing you. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Uh, good, how are you? I'm good. I see a couple of students have joined. Yeah, we've already Maybe. got a little crowd coming into play. Yeah, here. Let me see if I can share my slides. Yeah, make sure it works for you. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, oh, you have disabled the screen sharing. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, give it to you. 
I think I can make you the host. Now you should be able to you share. You can yours. have more than one host. So, so. Yeah. So I possible. think you can share now. Let me check. Yeah. Um, so do you see the. Yep. Without the notes and stuff like that, the actual person, because I have the notes here. So I want to make Yeah, sure. it looks great. Okay. 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 I'm ready. How was your day so far? Mine's been pretty good. Yeah, it's mostly meetings today. I had research meetings in the morning and then I have some meetings this and then meetings after. <laughs> okay, a lot of meetings. Yeah, mostly meetings. How about you? No, I'm just taking care of my kid. <laughs> okay, said. yeah, well, yeah. that has its benefits, right? Uh, it's kind of, uh, you, you really enjoy it, but uh, then you can think about you have a lot of research work to do. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> It, it can get stressful. Yeah, yeah. So it's this is, but but generally it's enjoyable. It's joyful to play with kids. I really like it. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. <clears throat> ah, there we go. Yeah, so we'll just wait a few more minutes, see if uh, other people join. We're up to nine <laughs> participants, so that's good. Yeah. That's nearly more than the people that come to my class. <laughs> I asked my students yesterday if they would like to join, but I, 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 I remembered a bit late, so most of them had left the, the meeting. But. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think I think managing Zoom is much easier than the WebEx. Yeah, it's way easier. Yeah. Have you tried Teams, Hoda? Hi, Aubrey. How are you? Which one, Team? No, I have not tried Team. How How about that? Is it good? It's amazing. I love Teams. Oh, so I have to. Uh, I think it's. Um, I'm afraid to switch between um, applications because students may get a bit confused. Yeah. yeah, confused. But maybe in the future, if we have the same issue, <laughs> I hope you don't know. Just in case. <laughs> yeah. So uh, is the team also, so can you have all the uh, students having their uh, webcam up, um, actually like this, showing their webcam and also be able to manage to mute them and everything like that? I, I don't know. Um, we, uh, Leshik and I run 1301 e-lectures um, and the students don't turn their cameras on. They just are all, I can see them all there as in the participants mm -hmm. list. And then they use the chat to ask questions and then they also use audio to ask questions. Uh, How they use the audio? Do they unmute themselves? They unmute themselves. That's right. Um, but the I think you can have video because Leshik and I do video and we both do video at the same time. But I just think they choose not to, you know. I, I think it's better not to just to preserve their bandwidth. That's <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, also, it's kind I of don't think that's going to have like 60 them. people with video on, you know. <laughs> they may dis be distracted. I'm not sure if everyone can see everyone's video or not. Oh, okay. Probably. Ethan said it also splits the screen. Yeah. In so my, that, uh, yeah. In my, you can split the screen. What's that? She said you can split the screen. What do you mean by splitting the screen? Yeah, I have mine set on like a um, um, split mode or something. It has view options and I have side by side mode. Mm. <clears throat> So split screen means that, for example, you share a part of it and you can work on the other side 
uh, to, for example, read some. Oh yeah, I don't know about that. Yeah. In well, that's amazing. Yesterday I had to do this, but when I switched between the screen that I shared and the document that I was reading, that that was a white page for the students because I record and had a look at the record. Then mm. when I switched between the screens, then the students were not able to see anything, even the screen that was shared. Oh, that's terrible. That I know on true. Zoom, I switch between sharing. I share between an iPad, my lap, and my laptop throughout lecture. I switch between them seamlessly. I have this problem with the with the uh, WebEx. Uh, actually, I was not able to figure how to do it with my because I have also a tablet with pen, which yeah. I would like to. to that's exactly what I'm doing. Yeah, um, but I did not figure out how to do it when we had time. So. Oh yeah. Yeah, I'm an empty easy. You just go. You just have a share button and you uh you click new share and i clicked ipad it has a button specifically for ipads i click that it shows my ipad and then i go back and click laptop and it shows my laptop so wow so what about uh Aubrey, does the team also has this feature or you have not to do with it? yeah teams has a feature where you share you say share screen and then you can click no, no, switch between devices mm -hmm. so well i don't know about devices i've never tried that but um but you can click which window you want to share oh yeah we do have this on the web yes. That's so i use discord too to help my students with um homework because mm -hmm. they're just like on it on their phones and stuff um and that one you share the whole entire screen like no matter what and i, I don't like that because then you have to be really careful about what oh, you're yeah. Doing. Yeah. Yeah. Like, don't check your That's email you know <laughs> yeah. Yeah. webex also has the feature yeah. that which application you want right. to share. Right. Right. Yeah, but, but i don't have the the luxury of having i was not able to figure out how to do the device switch right yeah i don't i don't have another device mm -hmm. so yeah I just have my laptop I, so we have around 18 that's interesting uh, yeah great okay it might be more convenient for people to come yeah yeah it's easier for sure yeah <clears throat> okay so i think we can probably uh start I can start start up does that sound good uh uh it, dr meliki meliki right maliki yeah maliki All i can right. introduce myself that's fine you want to do it okay <laughs> i felt like i was gonna do so that everyone uh, Go ahead. You, you go ahead and take over. <laughs> so everyone, please mute your uh, your your microphones. Uh, so um, just not get into accident voices here and there. Um, I am. Thank you very much, Harley. I'm Hoda Maliki. I'm from the School of Computer and Cyber Sciences here at Augusta University. Um, before going through the topic, uh, let me say that uh, my research focuses on security and privacy on the general area of computer science. I've done research in a variety of these directions through network, hardware uh, security, cloud security, and um, the um, current ongoing research, uh, which kind of this talk uh, is because of that research actually, is the smart contract privacy research. So, uh, explaining smart contract privacy uh, research is a bit hard uh, if I want to start without any background knowledge, uh, assuming students do not have that knowledge or my ideas. So instead, I prefer to give a tutorial talk about the basics of the blockchain technology. In this way, um, at least if you're not uh, even willing to uh, have a research in this direction, you will not know uh, or improve your knowledge in this uh, regard and later on if you have discussion with other people you know what you are talking about and what they are talking about so let's see okay uh, there are a couple of books uh, out there if you want to um, read more about it but it's mostly focused on the bitcoin because bitcoin was the first technology or a first application that introduced this technology Mastering Bitcoin and the Bitcoin and cryptocurrency technology. Uh, the Bitcoin crypto technology is a book that actually also explains the crypto primitives that are used for this uh, reason, but it does not go through the mathematic definition. It only gives you the idea of, of how these uh, primitives are assisting the security of this technology. And this is how this uh, presentation also will go on. So, first of all, uh, when we uh, hear about the uh, blockchain, uh, what we would 
really be interested in is to know how, uh, what is blockchain in general. So first of all, everyone probably will go, uh, make a Google, do a Google and figure out uh, what the blockchain is. Then you're gonna face a variety of definition for blockchain. But based on my research and understanding on blockchain, which I have done it for a year, I prefer the mastering blockchain by uh, Imran Bashir. It has the best definition, which actually covers this uh, technology um, concept. It says uh, the blockchain is a peer-to-peer -peer distributed ledger that is cryptographically secure, append-only, and immutable, and only you can add it to the end of this um, blockchain only via consensus or agreement among peers. As you can see in this, this definition, we have a lot of terms that are used. Uh, first of all, we figure out is a ledger, distributed one. Here, the distribution means that the ledger, um, uh, there is hundreds or thousands of copies of these ledgers in different uh, nodes or in different computers. So it's, it doesn't mean that the ledger is, um, is divided into parts and each node has some part of it. No, it means that it's duplicated in different nodes. And the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, word means that the underlying network, uh, which the blockchain uh, is built on top of it, is a peer-to-peer -peer network. And it, of course, uses the cryptography to make it secure. And because of crypto primitive that is used, you can only add to the end of this blockchain. You cannot remove from it. It's not just because of the technology. It's also because of the protocol, the definition of the protocol. Uh, immutable means um, it's extremely hard for a person or a computer to change the records that are stored in the blocks or change the blocks that are being added to the, blo uh, to the blockchain. And updatable only via consensus means that when you want to add a block to the chain, it will be extremely hard. Uh, it, uh, it, all the uh, peers should agree on the block that is being added. You cannot add any block and that's it. So this means it's pretty hard to cheat because all, you, all the nodes should also be um, corrupted uh, in order to cheat and add a, uh, a, a, block, a, chain, a block to the chain, which is not, uh, does not follow the protocol. Okay. So uh, now that uh, we understood the definition, let's see uh, why this technology was even introduced. What was the purpose of it? Um, around three decades ago, um, researchers started thinking of an open problem that are we able to have digital currency without the need of a, a trusted third party? And we also can prevent the double spending problem. What does this mean? and um, why this problem was even introduced. If you consider in the real world, if Alice wants to uh, actually buy some product from Bob, the image on the left side, if she has a physical cash, she'll go to the store and let's consider she only have $10. She will hand in this $10 and get the product and she will go away. Can she now spend the dollar, ten dollars that she gave, actually give it to Bob again? No, because she doesn't own it anymore. She doesn't have it in her hands anymore because it's a physical cash. So double spending means that you be able to spend the same exact money twice more than one. It's not just twice more than one. Of course, in the physical cash, you cannot do it because when you hand the money, or that item to the other person, you don't have it. You're not in the position of it. So there is no double spending problem in the physical cash. Um, in the current world, however, let's consider that Alice want uh, to buy some product from Bob, but Bob is pretty far, far away. So Alice cannot go to that store. Let's consider Bob is Amazon. Amazon doesn't have a store that you go to shop. So you have to do it online. How are you gonna do it? You are gonna use kind of digital cash. So the way that is uh, dealt with nowadays, like the PayPal, the, the uh, current online account on the banks, is that you will both trust a, a trusted third party, like the bank. You both trust bank. Since you both trust bank, Alice will transfer money through the bank. 
the bank is actually the trusted third party. And through this, the bank will make sure that when Alice spends that money, it will be decreased, uh, it will be subtracted from her account and added to Bob's account or Amazon in our example, and make sure if it's a digital currency and Alice used it once, if Alice tries to use it again, bank will prevent it, will not certify it, will not sign it, and so on. So in the centralized digital cash or uh, with the third party, it's really uh, easy to deal with the digital currency and prevent the double spending. Now the question is, can we do it, the have a digital currency and uh, without a third party and also be able to prevent the double spending? And this was the problem that was um, being uh, three decades ago uh, was actually an open problem and researchers start working on it. But now you may ask, okay, why we even need to not have a third party? What's the problem with the third party? The problem with the third party is it's expensive and time consuming. What do I mean? Um, instead of considering that Alice wants to shop uh, from Amazon, let's consider Alice wants to transfer money to Bob, which Bob lives in Asia, in another country. We are in the US, he is in another country. Transferring money from one account in one country to another account, especially in another bank, in another country, is really expensive if you have tried it. And it's time consuming. That means when you apply the, the, the transaction, Despite you have to pay a, per, a specific percentage of the money that you are transferring, you also have to wait two to three or four days for this money to be transferred. And this is why the third party is pretty expensive and costly and uh, is preferred to be removed. So the researchers started working on it and they started giving solutions. However, after a couple of years or a couple of months, uh, even uh, some of them have developed application for it and was being used for a while. There were found bugs in them and resolved. Uh, and each time a new problem, uh, a new bug was figured out through the uh, proofs and computation. And it went on uh, until finally in 2008, a white paper came out, which gave the idea of the blockchain technology. Um, the author was named Satoshi Nakamoto. Actually, this is not a, a real name. It's a pseudonym that it, it was used. We don't know if it's an organization, if it's a person or not. And in this white paper, um, actually this author kind of put all the um, um, parts of the puzzle that other researchers have solved and solved the final piece of that puzzle and was able to answer to this two decade problem of um, the digital currency without third party. And a lesson that we learned from this slide is that always know that the research um, and when you have a problem in the research is not about you solving the whole entire open problem. It's a progress, research is a progress. Each time we will fix or solve a small part of this problem and other researchers and your colleagues will solve other parts. And it's like a puzzle that each part of this puzzle should be figured out until finally these pieces will be put together and the entire open problem will be solved. And uh, so uh, never give up when you're doing research and always try to at least solve a small piece of that big problem. Okay, so now that we understood what uh, the blockchain technology is trying to solve or what the blockchain technology solves, let's see how you can use it for your uh, purpose. So here, if um, Bob, let's consider that Bob uh, wants to, um, oh, excuse me, let me see if I can, um, I don't have my chat open here. So, okay, I have it here now in the case that, that you, uh, anyone asks. Uh, and by the way, feel free to ask questions, interrupt me, that's fine. And I will answer it uh, as soon as I receive the questions, okay? So uh, now let's see how we can uh, deal, um, uh, use this uh, blockchain or uh, generally uh, in this example is the Bitcoin. So if Bob wants to shop from Amazon, Bob first of all needs to have wallet. Even with, with the physical cash, you have a wallet. With your credit cards, you have wallet. With the digital currency, you also need a wallet. In this wallet, Bob will store his uh, address uh, or uh, some secret keys, some information which is related to its digital currency. 
And of course, Bob needs to have that digital currency, otherwise he cannot spend it. Anyways, so, and on the other side, Amazon will put its address for the digital currency online so everyone can have access to it and look at it and send the money to that address. Now then, Bob wants to shop after computing the amount of money, its wallet will create a transaction. A transaction actually specifies which person is paying to whom what amount of money. Of course, the transaction will not contain names, but we're going to see in detail what the transaction will have. And then this transaction will be sent to the network. Let's consider that the network is a black box. So some magical things happen there. And then finally, a confirmation, let me see. A confirmation will be received by Amazon. When the Amazon receives the confirmation, it will ship your product. And this is how you use the uh, blockchain in our example, Bitcoin, and spend your digital currency. But what happens behind the scene is uh, shown at the uh, uh, bottom size of your slide. There is each node in this network will receive this transaction that you, you send. Let's consider all the type of the nodes are the same. We have different type of nodes in the, in the network, but let's consider all of them are, are the same. So each node will receive your transaction, will put it in a pool of transaction that you can see is like a cloud. And then that node, which is a miner, or if it's a miner, will pick some of these transactions, create a block, do some specific uh, structured uh, computation. And if that miner, all the miners are trying to do the same. And, but the miner that solves the problem faster and correctly is the winner miner and is the person who can add the created block at the end of the blockchain. So let's consider this lucky guy here it was the miner which created this block faster than everyone and added to the blockchain. After all the nodes agree on it, the miner will receive some rewards. And this is why the nodes or the miners that the nodes that actually create the block, we call them miners, are motivated to do that because they are receiving rewards per creating blocks. So now, uh, any questions so far? I believe no. So let's go further and see. Uh, let's a bit zoom into these blocks that you can see. Um, still, this is not the very detailed uh, block uh, chain. Uh, it gives you a simplified version of the block. And by the way, in the whole presentation, as an example, I'm talking about the Bitcoin blockchain because you need an example to uh, talk about uh, some details. And uh, the best one is the one that everyone is familiar with, with which is the block, uh, Bitcoin. So if you look at one single block, you can see it has a header and it has a body. The body contains some transactions and the header has some, um, some names that may not be familiar, may be familiar, but we're gonna talk about it. And blocks are, connected to between uh, connected with each other through a uh, arrow here that's shown so this connection that is shown through the arrow is the reason for the name chain in the blockchain and the block itself is the reason for the name block in the blockchain technology title so now um in order to understand um, what's, uh, what exactly contains in Hooder and what exactly contains in the, the body of the blockchain, let's have a look at the crypto primitives that are used um, in the header of the blockchain. I know that um, um, talking about math uh, is a bit boring, especially if you go into the details, so I won't bore you with the mathematic definitions. I'll try just give you some definition and understanding about each concept that is used. So we use a cryptographic hash functions. Merkle tree is actually not a crypto primitive. It's a, a tree, but uses cryptographic hash function. And this is why I just wanted in this topic. And we also will talk about the digital signature. These three items are being used uh, in the header of a blockchain 
to make it secure like uh, today that you are having it. So let's dive into each of them. What's a cryptographic hash function? So a, crypto, a hash function generally um, is a function. So it has input and it has an output. The input of a, the hash function can be an arbitrary size. So the size of the uh, hash function uh, input, it does not matter. However, this function, no matter what size input you give it, will always give you a fixed size output. For the Bitcoin, especially Bitcoin is 256 bits, but may vary depending on which application you are using. And it's efficient and also it's deterministic. What do, do we mean by deterministic? That means if you give the same message twice to the hash function, it should give you the same output. So this is the general definition of a hash function. But for a crypto hash function, we have some specific properties which are listed under the red titles. One is the pre-image resistance. What does it mean? That means if you hash a message and show the output of the hash to a person, it should be invisible for that person or computer or device to figure out what was the message that this is its hash. So it's hard to find out the message from the, the input from the output. The second property, which should be in a crypto hash function, is the second pre-image pre resistance. What does this mean? That means if I have my message M1 and I apply the hash function, I'll get the hash of M1. Now, is it possible for me to find another message that gives me this exact same hash value? This should be extremely hard. Why this is important? Because the adversary may be able to pick its message, M1, apply the hash, and see if the hash is the same, we'll figure out that he can cheat later on using it. And he doesn't need to know what your message is, you see? So these are very critical um, properties for crypto hash function, which really is important when you are building hash function, crypto hash function, and is uh, useful for all the crypto uh, solutions that are being provided out there. The third and the last property is collision resistant. What does it mean? That means um, it should be even hard to find any two messages, any two messages that map to the same hash value. Um, why even we are talking about collision resistant? Because as I explained, the input size usually is larger than the output size. We said any size of input. So as you can see, the possibility for the inputs is greater than the output. So it is obvious that some of these inputs will be mapped to the same hash value of output. But the thing is, the function should be designed in a way that finding these two values should be extremely hard. Any questions so far? So good news, we are done with the crypto hash function. So let's have a look at the Merkle tree. So a Merkle tree is actually uh, a tree, but for the case of uh, the blockchain, they use binary tree. And this tree, the leaves of the tree are the records or the data set uh, in your database or here uh, in your block, um, which you want to kind of preserve their uh, correctness or integrity. And per each, uh, per each value, you apply a hash uh, function on it and apply hash repeatedly until you reach the root, which I can explain. A Merkle tree actually allows computers uh, on a network to verify individual records without having to review and compare versions of the entire database. So it's, it's a very uh, useful uh, data structure. So let me explain uh, this uh, in more detail. Let's consider that we have A, B, C, D as our record in a, trans in a uh, blockchain or in a database. It doesn't matter where. These are the data that we want to preserve their integrity and correctness. So what we're gonna do first, we're gonna apply hash, a crypto hash function on them and uh, get the value. So HA is the hash of A and so on. Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna concatenate each two uh, neighbor nodes 
and then apply the hash function on the concatenation of that two hash values. So H1, HA and HB will be concatenated and then it's gonna go through the equate to hash function. We can now repeat this as uh, uh, so many times until we reach only a single hash value. This single hash value is called the root of the Merkle tree. Usually, you need only to store the root of the Merkle tree. And this is really um, preserves uh, the storage. It will save the storage for you and also provides you the security properties that I will explain more here. So we only need to store the root. So the, one of the properties of Merkle tree is it will enable you to know that the data has not, not been tampered. Now, why? Look, let's consider that we have A, B, C, D, and we only have the root stored somewhere, okay? And someone will tamper with the uh, record B. It changed it to B uh, prime. What will happen? If you change B to B prime, that means the hash value of B prime will be different from the hash value of B because we said it's hard to find two messages that match to the same hash, okay? Since this hash will be uh, different, then the hash on the upper uh, layer also will be different because HB prime is different from HB. So all the red um, letters that shown shows which values will be ch changed. As you can see, by changing only one record or tampering with one of them, the root of this Merkle tree will be changed. Another property, uh, actually, because of this um, actually feature, uh, we can use Merkle tree for uh, proof of membership. What does this mean? I want to make sure that B is part of this uh, was is part of this my data set, or I want to make sure that B is not tampered. Both cases will be possible. Let's consider the proof of membership. How can I do that? You need to store, you need to extract or store or have some of the hash values. I will not go into detail how you will get it, but also in Bitcoin, you can get these hash values. But in reality, the blockchain only will store the root of the Merkle tree. But in the case of membership, if you have B and you want to prove the membership of B, you will compute its hash value. You should have the hash value of its neighbor, compute the upper hash value through this. You also have to have the hash value of the other side and you are able to go through up to three HB root. And later compare the root that you have computed with the root that was stored in your blockchain. And in this way, you can make sure that if a transaction uh, in a blockchain was being added or was there from the beginning, okay? So this is a way that you are able to make sure that no transaction is being changed when a block is added to the uh, blockchain. None of these tr transactions can be changed because if you change it, the root will be changed. No transaction can be added or removed from the uh, block because of this Merkle tree. So Merkle tree together with the crypto hash function are playing a very important role and are giving us the immutability that we talked about previously. But I will again explain these in more details. The third crypto, so any question? So the double line, uh, sorry, I just saw, the double line means concatenation. That means you attach two values together or put them uh, beside each other and then compute the value, uh, the hash value of the uh, result. That's the question that what does the double line mean? In this function, it means concatenation. And concatenation means that putting two messages beside each other. Um, so let's go through the digital uh, signature. Explaining digital signature will be slightly diff difficult because I have not talked about symmetric and asymmetric uh, encryption schemes, but I will briefly talk about it here. So in the crypto cryptography, we have two types of encryption methods. One is asymmetric, one is symmetric encryption. In symmetric, so let's consider me and Harley want to exchange messages, encrypted messages. 
Uh, if I use a symmetric encryption, me and Harley will have the same in, uh, key to encrypt and decrypt both cell sites. And it's pretty fast, efficient, and it's great. But the problem with symmetric encryption is how can I exchange the key with Harley? I need a secure channel to do it. For this reason, the asymmetric encryption was introduced. In the asymmetric encryption, you have two different keys. One is considered public key, which everyone can have a look at it. Everyone will know it. You will publicly announce it so everyone can have it. And one is a secret or private key, which you're going to hold on secretly and don't show it to anyone for yourself. These two keys have some specific relationship between them. It's not like randomly picking two random numbers. They, there should be some computation relationship between them. Using the public key, now Harley can encrypt a message. Harley or anyone in the world can encrypt the message using the public key. And since only me, I have the secret key, I'm able only to decrypt that a message. So whoever in the world wants to encrypt a message and send it to me, they can use the public key and they can make sure that only me can decrypt it because I have the uh, secret key. Now, uh, let's not consider how everyone will know that this public key is for me or not and what the procedure. Um, um, we can discuss it offline, but this is the general concept. Now the public key, private key, or asymmetric key also can be used with another purpose, which is the signature. The signature, in, if you want to sign something, you have to use the keys in another direction. Since I own this secret key, public key, I'm the owner of it. That means I have the secret key. When I want to sign something, I will use my secret key because nobody else has this secret key. And if I sign it with my, or in, kind of encrypt it with my, I cannot say encrypted. If I sign it with my secret key, that means nobody else had this key. So this is truly me. But then you can verify my signature because everyone has my public key. So everyone can apply the function and see if the message is the same as the message that is being signed, the signature. So the signature is also uses the asymmetric encryption, but uses the keys in another direction. You use the private key to sign, you use the public key to verify. And this is how it works. I won't go through these details again here, but briefly we'll say, when you want to use asymmetric, encrypt, uh, asymmetric encryption for a signature, there should be a specific algorithm to generate, to generate this pair of secret key and a public key and private key for you. Then you're gonna use your secret key to, uh, to sign you the message. Later on, you need the message itself, the signature, uh, to be, and the public key to verify if the signature was correct or not. Yes, it's, 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 it's exactly like RSA. You can use RSA for, uh, for a signature as well. So RSA is a asymmetric encryption. You can use any asymmetric encryption like RSA either for encrypting or signature. For both cases, you can use it. Okay, so this is another kind of more visual definition of the signature. You have from the look at the left side, you have the message. What you're going to do first, apply the hash function and then sign the hash function. Why sign? Why applying the hash function? Just to make it a fixed size, uh, shrink the size of the message uh, to uh, preserve its space. So you don't want to have a, an email with, I don't know, um, 500 or 1,000 words and then have the signature on top of it. Instead, you can apply hash function on 1,000 1, words and then uh, sign the hash of that, which is, will be pretty small. And this is how they're going to do. And then you're going to send the message with the signature to the destination. Now the destination wants to make sure that uh, you uh, have signed it. How we're going to do is it going to calculate the hash of the message because it has the message. Then it will use your public key to kind of decrypt your signature 
And since the decryption of the signature will give you the hash, it will compare the two hash values. If they are the same, that means you signed this message. But if anyone changes the message, then the signature will not match the message. And in this way, they will know you have not signed this message or the signature was wrong. They will not figure out what was wrong, but they will figure out something is going on wrong. Anyway, so the signature is also another crypto um, feature that's being used in, uh, the, um, in the blockchain technology. So what's a feature of a, uh, of a signature? Um, the digital sh signature should have the same features of the physical signature. When you sign a, a signature, everyone should be able to verify that this is your signature. The other thing is if you sign a paper, nobody should be able to cut this signature that you did on this message on this paper and paste it on another one. That is the unforgeability. That means you, if you have signed a couple of messages digitally, nobody should be able to them to use this information to sign a message that you never have signed. And these are two important features of a signature that should satisfy, uh, is crucial to be satisfied. Otherwise, uh, the signature uh, is not safe to be used in that way. So as I talked, the signature uses asymmetric encryption, which is you have a public key, you have a private key. There's an idea that, okay, since the public key is a key that everyone knows and is kind of assigned to you, why we don't use it as identity of a person? So if I want to say, uh, this is Hoda, I can use as public key as an identification for her. And so in the Bitcoin, they actually use, or in blockchain technology generally, in the public key as an identification for a person. But wait a minute. Are you uh, restricted to only one identification uh, value? No. You can generate as many as public key, private key uh, pairs as you want. And all these public keys can be representing you. And in this way, kind of Bitcoin is saying that it's providing the anonymity. However, to preserve space, instead of having the public key stored in the the transaction that later on we're going to see, Bitcoin applies, asks the, uh, its protocol to apply hash on the public key to reduce the size of the public key and uh, re reduce the space inside the, uh, the transaction size to preserve more space for other transactions in a blockchain. So uh, general idea is that uh, the public keys represent as identity for the person in the digital currency, and you may have more than one identity. And this is what's uh, actually explained here. Instead of having a centralized center to manage your identity, you can generate as much as a public key, private key, keep the private key, publish the public key if you want, or send it to anyone that you want, and that public key will present your identity. And you can also, apply kind of anonymity but nowadays we don't we know that you cannot preserve anonymity through this feature but to some extent bitcoin um, users and developers thought that this is the correct way to provide the anonymity and um, the hash of the public key generally in bitcoin is con is considered as your address so when a person asks you okay i want to send a digital currency to you what's your address by the address they mean was the hash of your public key. And actually all these details are handled with, uh, through your wallet that you're using for this purpose. You don't have to worry about it though. So wallet is taking care of it, but at least know what the address means in the digital currency. Okay, now that I gave you definitions for the, uh, uh, for the names that are mentioned in the header of the blockchain. Let's go through the transaction. Any question? How much time do we have? We still have to, okay. 
uh, I hope I can f finish the transaction uh, 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 today and then later up catch, uh, catch up on the next uh, uh, more discussion about how all these work together. So now let's focus on the transaction part or the body of the blockchain. So uh, what's a transaction? It's, the transaction is actually a data structure. Uh, that encodes the transfer of any value between two participants in the blockchain technology in, in general. Uh, so why we say value? Because in Bitcoin, you are transferring digital currency uh, or um, uh, the, some call it cryptocurrency. But uh, the blockchain technology is um, more, much more beyond the digital currency. You can use it for other uh, transfer other type of values and assets. This is why we generally say the transaction is a data structure to transform any value from one person or participant, participant can be a device, computer, wallet, whatever, to another one through the blockchain system. So um, in the uh, each transaction in the Bitcoin has an identifier for the Bitcoin, it's called TXID, TX represents the notation transaction ID is for ID. So TXID is the identity for the transaction, which is the hash of the transaction. So if you hash the transaction, that value will be the ID of the transaction. Now, uh, generally in any kind of blockchain, you have two type of transactions. For Bitcoin, these are the names, but for other uh, blockchain technology, they may have different names, but the concept is, is the same. So one is the coin-based transaction, the other is the non-coin-based transaction. What's a coin-based transaction? Coin-based transaction is a transaction that generates the value, here is the digital currency, out of nowhere. And this coin-based transaction will be only added to your block in order to provide or give reward to the miner that created the block. So if you consider uh, or have read the white paper of the Bitcoin, you can see that Satoshi at the very beginning of developing this Bitcoin has created, uh, considered 50, I think, 50 um, Bitcoins, BTC, at the very beginning. But now we have much more uh, Bitcoins in this uh, environment, this network, from where this money came. These money were generated and created through the coin-based transaction out of nowhere, like, what do you say, um, stamping new cash money, something like that. And what's a non-coin -trans uh, transaction? It's a transaction that actually transfers value from one uh, node or person or uh, participant to another one. So it does not create any currency or any value out of nowhere. You should have money or digital currency available there. It will only transfer from one address to another. So this is the structure of a transaction in general. It has some inputs and it has some outputs. However, for the coin-based transaction, since it creates the currency out of nowhere, it doesn't need to have any input. It will only have output and the a value of input can easily be uh, guessed at the amount of the input uh, out there so why we may have more than one output because you may want to give it to different people or into different addresses uh, or it's because um, you can um, spend the money and put it in your different accounts. Let's consider each, each identity or each address of yours is an account. You can send the money as a miner to different accounts. You don't want to send all the money in one account, so you can distribute it however you want. This is why you can have different outputs. Each output is the destination of the address that you want to send the uh, digital currency to that coin. Um, mostly uh, for the Bitcoin, the first transaction in the blockchain will be this coin-based transaction. Um, and uh, based on the protocol of that specific uh, block, uh, uh, blockchain, 
um, there are some rules uh, uh, about when you can or the miner can use this type of money because this is a digital currency but when you can use it uh, there are different uh, based on the protocol there's uh, different rules for it for the bitcoin case after 100 confirmation the miner is able to use that and why is this the case because they want to make sure that miner has not cheated in creating that uh, block and adding it to the blockchain. So 100 confirmation is to um, preserve the entire um, uh, network from miners who try to cheat. But the question will be here, what's a confirmation? Okay, let's consider that I have block one, I, I as a miner have added the block name block one to the end of the blockchain. Each block that will be later on added to this block will be considered as one confirmation. So when it says 100 confirmation, that means me as a miner, when I add a block to the blockchain, I have to wait for 100 other blocks to be added to the blockchain, then I will receive, be able to spend that money. Otherwise, this money will be blocked, okay? So any questions so far? Okay. So um, in the Bitcoin world, I see, okay, that's fine. Um, in the Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin or blockchain in general, uh, like the uh, actual physical money, you have different notations with different uh, value of the money, like the BTC, like uh, then uh, it, it, the amount of Bitcoin, it's going to go to the Satoshi. Satoshi has, for example, I think 100 million Satoshis will be one BTC and so on. So we have these definitions for them. But despite that, uh, let's consider and, and let's know what will be the Coinbase uh, transaction value for a miner who creates a new block and adds it to blockchain. It depends. And before 2009 or uh, at that period, very beginning, if you were lucky to create a block and add it to the chain, you received 50. Bit, uh, bitcoins which is huge amount of money nowadays but after uh, each uh, specific amount of blocks that are being added to the blockchain the amount of the coinbase uh, transaction value will decrease and be reduced to half of the previous amount so in 2012 it got to 25 bitcoins in 2016 it uh, reduced to 12 and a half bitcoins and nowadays it's only 6.25 and a couple of years later, it depends how fast these blocks are being added to the blockchain, it will be half of it, which is three point something. And um, based on this, if you do a calculation, after a while, there will be no more Coinbase transactions. Uh, actually, no more uh, Coinbase transaction for creating a new block. Um, and this is how everyone is wondering, so what will happen uh, when uh, there will be no reward for creating a block. Will still the miners be motivated to create a block and add it to the blockchain? Will the blockchain kind of be, uh, the Bitcoin will be um, kind of disappearing after that because nobody's willing to continue their work? And there are some uh, wondering about this, what will happen later on. But despite these issues that people are thinking about, let's go back and see what is a non-coin-based transaction? We have around 10 minutes. I hope I can uh, explain this um, quickly and uh, make it understandable for you. So as we said, non-coin-based transaction is to transfer money from one address to another. So you need input to refer the money that you have and output to say to whom you are giving it. So you need inputs and outputs. The number of inputs and the number of output depends from where you want to take the money, from which address, maybe you have more than one address, and the first address you have, let's consider one BTC, in the second you have three BTCs, so you want four BTC to give to another person, so you have to have two inputs, one from one address, another from another address, and so on. And maybe you, want, you don't want to spend the whole money, uh, you will split it into two outputs, and so on. So I will explain it with an example. Let's consider that Satoshi 
uh, with the, uh, Satoshi's address is 111. And Satoshi has 50, has uh, created, developed this uh, Bitcoin uh, application and gave himself 50 BTC at the very beginning. So there is a coin-based transaction with 50 BTC in it. And later on, Satoshi owes uh, Alice the 50 BTC. Alice address is 243. Uh, so what, does, uh, what Satoshi does is it's going to create a non-coin-based transaction with an input which points the input is only a pointer. It points to the output of the previous transaction. So the transaction TX0 is the uh, ID of the transaction, which we said is the hash value of it. And then the output of this transaction will be the amount of money and the address of Alice. As you can see down is 50 BTC to address 243. Uh, Later on, Alice tries to buy a t-shirt from a store with the address 194. What she does is, again, she will take this uh, output as her input, but she doesn't want uh, to buy an expensive t-shirt. She, she just wants to buy a t-shirt which costs two P BTC. What she does is she's gonna create two outputs, one with the uh, two BTC, which will go to the address 195 for which you can see the output one. The other is another output, which will give the remaining of this amount to herself to the 243. This is her Alice. Later, the store, uh, the C store that Alice did shopping, uh, owner will buy a cup of coffee from Alice coffee shop. So but Alice here has another account for her coffee shop, which is 212. So this person will use the output one of the transaction two, as you can see, as an input, and again, split it into two. Part of it will keep it for himself and part of it will give it to Alice uh, for the shopping. Now, if later on Alice wants to buy an expensive item, which she needs money that is, does not fit in, into one of its output address, she needs to take more than one address uh, of uh, digital currency, mix them together, and then uh, create an output. As you can see, this is why um, some transactions have more than one out input and some of them have more than out one uh, output. So each coin-based transaction should at least have one output and one input, but it can go beyond it. Um, the point here is, in, at least in the uh, Bitcoin, um, the outputs that are not that have not been sent yet are called unspent transaction output UTXO and all the miners will keep track of these UTXOs in their storage. They have to do it otherwise they will lose all the uh, effort that ha they have done for their block uh, that created because if the miner make a mistake and add a transaction that previously has spent the money that means double spending and the miner will not get the reward. So miners usually keep track of the unspended money and as soon as anyone spends that money they will cross it out from their list. And this is, uh, I will explain later, but this is the main uh, idea of preventing the double spending of the same digital currency. So for a, a, a payment to be valid, one of the uh, criteria that the uh, Bitcoin protocol or mostly blockchains have is to make sure that this output has not been spent before. And this is how you prevent the double spending. So now let's see uh, generally how this works. I'll go through it very fast. Um, I have 10K Satoshis. Uh, I will uh, split them into two outputs. Why? Let's keep it aside. 140K, 150K. And then for the 40K will be another input to another. And you can see it will get really complicated here with different transactions. As you may have noticed, the output amount for the trans, uh, transaction zero does not equal to the uh, input amount. So the input amount is 100K, but the output amount, if you sum them up, will be 90K Satoshi. What has happened to the rest of this money and where this money will go? The answer is, um, in the reality, and in the concept of the blockchain, when the miner creates a block, the miner is not forced to add transaction to the body. So if you are a miner and you
Um, so I have a question from Nisha. She says, um, as we know, each new technology has both pros and cons. So my question is, what is the drawback side of integrating a blockchain technology? So it's a lot. So I cannot talk about generally blockchain technology, but you can see which blockchain you are using. But if we consider just the Bitcoin itself, because of the proof of work that we are using nowadays, it's really not efficient from the regard of Power consumption, it usually consumes a lot of power. Besides that, all the nodes need to store a huge amount of data, which is also an uh, issue with the storage. We have the efficiency problem. We have the, uh, some of them have the scaling prob problem. And there are a lot of uh, problems with the blockchain. And this is what I said with the research, you have to be patient and uh, don't uh, uh, lose the hope because there are issues with the uh, some technology. Eventually, the researchers will step-by-step step solve these problems. You have to see in the very big picture uh, what are the advantage and if the advantage are better or more or heavily uh, than the disadvantage so you can go and improve it. And uh, currently, the, um, the very uh, actually important advantage of the uh, um, Bitcoin is, uh, or the blockchain journal is the part of you don't have to trust anyone. And you can do this transfer of the asset or value, whatever you want to consider without the third party trust. And, and this is really important uh, to have it. So we have much more free world in this area. And, and beside that, we also can have it in a way that it be anonymous. So uh, as you may know, if you do transaction with uh, through your bank, the bank exactly will know from which store you are shopping, what are the favorite items, which are which stores are your favorite, what time you do this, all these details will be gathered. And this is the big data, part of the big data that we are tying, which deviates your privacy in a way, even though they are not explicitly saying that, but they are gathering this information. But the, through the blockchain technology, you can eliminate a lot of these privacy leakage that you are having because of the use of third party. And the other point is, what if the third party uh, gets corrupted at some point? Um, so you will lose. There are a lot of cons and pros. Uh, so it's your decision based on the company that you are using, uh, you are working at based on the benefits that you want to get and why you want to use the blockchain technology, then you have to make a decision. But know that this technology will not remain like that. Of course, researchers are working uh, hardly on it to improve its security, privacy, reduce the problems, uh, increase the scalability and um, efficiency. So there is a lot of research here going on. But thank you for your question, Isha. Anyone else has question? So Harley, do I have time or should I end it here? Let me see. Uh, I still have a couple of slides to go on, like four or five. But it's not that much. I, I can explain it pretty fast. So yeah, uh, listen, you can have, you go ahead? Yeah, you still have three minutes. So if you go oh. a over something, it's not a big deal. Yeah, I will go for maybe five minutes more than our usual time. Yeah, I mean, okay. that's fine. Okay, so uh, let me uh, explain here again. So as I said, the miner is not forced to add any transaction to the block. The miner can only compute the uh, difficulty or the problem that is generally defined by the protocol. And if he's able to add to solve it, he can add the uh, block to the blockchain. Why the, so how can we convince the miner to add our transaction to the blockchain, to its block, uh, so it can be added to the chain? The way to do this convincing is to pay him transaction fee. So based on the number of inputs and outputs in the transaction, as you say, the size of the transaction may vary. It may be a small transaction, it may be a large transaction. If it's a small transaction, maybe the miner will be more willing to add it. Why? Because he can add more transaction to his blockchain and get more transaction fee. So when you want to uh, actually uh, send a transaction uh, to the network, you, you and together with your wallet, actually you don't do what the wallet is doing. This is why it's important which wallet you're picking for your purpose. The wallet will compute what kind of, what amount of fee uh, to uh, actually give as a transaction fee to the miner to convince the miner to add uh, it to its block. 
So if you put more transaction fee, the miner, you will, with higher probability, your transaction will be added to the um, block and be added to the blockchain. So it's really important uh, the transaction fee is a motivation for the miner. And this 10K Satoshi that was left, uh, left here in the addition of these outputs is the transaction fee. So the transaction fee will be any fee that comes from the subtraction of the input, the addition of uh, the sum of the input and the output. If this uh, is a subtraction, uh, anything is left there, then the miner will take it as a transaction fee. How through the Coinbase transaction? It will add it to the 6.25 Bitcoins that it has. It will add the rest of this take case, the Satoshi in there and everything will go well. Um, so this is how it goes. When you want to transfer some money, um, uh, use your blockchain, uh, your Bitcoin, what you have to do is first create a, a pair of um, secret key, private key, then hash your public, uh, public key, which this hash value will be your address. And then, um, and then when uh, someone wants to send you a money, you need to send him or her your address so he or she knows where to send the money to. And then there will be, uh, first of all, uh, it will make sure that the uh, money is not spent. Of course, the uh, sender um, will creating the transaction is not doing anything. The uh, check is being done by the miner and the network itself. But anyways, um, what will happen then is the uh, sender of the money should prove to you and to the whole network that he owns the money. How he will do that? By signing the transaction that he creates. So look at the example uh, uh, at the end of the page. You see transaction one and transaction two. Let's consider I, I own the I, let's consider that I own the output zero of the transaction one, that is two BTC, I'm the owner of it. And I want to send this money to Harley. How could Harley and other people make sure that I am the owner of it? What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a transaction named transaction two or its ID's transaction two with an input which refers to my output, to the amount of money, the output zero. Okay, and then we'll create an output zero, which in this output zero, the two BTC, for example, goes to, uh, 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 to Harley's account or address. So the address of Harley is mentioned in the output zero uh, of transaction two. Then the way that I will prove to Harley and others that I am in position of this money is I'm going to sign the transaction to the input output combination with my secret key and put the signature at the bottom of the transaction too. Now the way that everyone can confirm is since in each output you're going to put the address of the owner of that money, so my address is 143, now Harley can use the 143 to decrypt my signature. If the signature decryption is the same as, as the message content of the, uh, the transaction, then Harley can make sure that I'm the owner of that because I now have the secret key of the address 143. And this is the way that I'm proving that this money, digital currency, I'm the owner of this digital currency. So, so do you see how it goes? So the signature is a way to prove that you are the owner of that money. Any question? Okay, so this is a real example of a transaction. The very first beginning one uh, the, is the uh, address of, is the hash of the previous transaction, which points to the output of it. And then we have uh, the index, which shows which output of that transaction you are referring. Let's consider it has output zero, output one, output two. Here is this output zero. And then here is the, we have some um, hash values and signature. This is the signature part. And you have the value of, 
that you want to transfer to other person, let's consider I want to transfer this value to Carly. So the value that I want to transfer in Satoshi will be uh, given here. And this is the address of Har Harley who will receive this money. Why I have to put the address? Because later on, Harley will use this address to prove he is the owner of it through his private key and so on. So I won't go into these details and I will stop my talk here. Um, the real important thing is uh, please have all these topics and description in mind because uh, the next talk probably will be two weeks. Uh, next week is the spring break, two weeks from now. Uh, I'll try to review it uh, quickly, but you still need to catch up. Uh, and the rest of these talks will be based on what I explained um, today. I hope it was it was really in, uh, joyful for me to talk about it. I hope everyone understood and um, enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Harley. Thank you. Awesome job. I really enjoyed uh, the presentation. Thank you. I learned, uh, I didn't know a ton about, I'm trying to find my cursor, uh, a ton about blockchain to begin with. So I was happy to get to learn about it a bit with the students. That's great. So I'll have a lot of great uh, things to talk about in our next tutorial. Yeah, uh, yeah. It, it, the rest of this, actually, the rest of it, I won't say is is the basics of blockchain number two. Nice. So, yes, it's going to be great. Yeah, I hope All to right. see you two weeks from now, everyone. Yep, yeah, 17th, right? I think 17th. I, I, I think so. Yeah, I have to yeah. see my friend. Yep, yeah, two, two Fridays from now. Awesome. Thank and you. And by the way, uh, by the way, whoever is interested and likes to do research on this topic, uh, feel free to email me, send me messages. Now the offices are closed, but later on, come to my office and we can discuss about it. Thank you. Have a nice day. Awesome. So thanks, everybody. Let me just stop the sharing. Uh... Yeah, I think you have to like tell it that I'm host again. <laughs> How should I do that? I don't know. Is there any button? Like, is there a button on my face or anything that like? It says manage. No, it says <clears throat> stop video. I have reaction and meeting. I have just the end meeting here as something that I know I can click on. Hmm. I have the. Like, if you is there like a, a a like any buttons that show up if you hoover like if I hoover over your. Face, I'm the host now here. Maybe I can change this to host. Uh, okay, make host. I I change it. To you. Now okay. You yeah, that way I can I can stop it and okay. If you wanted to leave, you can or whatever. Okay. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Harley. Yep. Thank you. Bye, bye. Thanks, everybody.